Welcome back, everyone. Today I have a submission from one of the Facebook groups I'm in. Somebody messaged me these two photos and saying they're having some trouble in Fusion trying to make it like Hizzle does. I'm going to show you how I do this in Fusion. Now, the first thing I need to do here is to create a sketch. And I'm going to choose my top down view if I can select this properly. And just click on this plane here. And now I'm sketching onto this top plane. Now, the first thing I want to do here is create my stock. This is for a rectangle. So I can either choose two points, press this one up here, or again, press the hotkey of R to make a rectangle. And it doesn't really matter where you put it at. It's all going to be corrected when we go into our design element anyway. So we can go over here and do this. And it looks like I'm already in metric, but my design needs to be 14 inches by 10 inches. But I know that my 14 inches is an inch is 25.4 millimeters. 25.4 millimeters. So I can type in that equation there, 14 times 25.4 and hit tab and it takes me over to the other dimension where I can type in 10 times 25.4. And now I have two already created dimensions. It's in metric. You can change that right here if you like from units. Although the design units is going to be different than our manufacturing units. So you can make design in inches and move over to manufacturing and you'll have to change that also to inches if you want to work that way. Since this is a relatively easy design, I'm just going to leave it how it is. Add the text. The easy way to center this is go corner to corner. Enter my text as Will Clayton. Let's make sure I spelled that right. Will Clayton. Okay. Yes. And you can select from the different fonts here. I've already gone through and selected the one that I think looks the most similar to this one. The C is a little different, but the rest of the letters all have this sort of effects to it. This is your entire Windows library. However, the fonts available in Easel are not loaded into Windows yet. So you could go through and download the fonts from dafont, D-A-F-O-N-T dot com that I'll put a link to that in the description that um, are described in easel. I think it's Homestead for this one in easel. So you just have to look up Homestead on Defont.com and download it there. But I just picked one that's close enough here and I've adjusted the height. I think the default it comes in as 10 millimeters to something that's close without going outside of our bounds here. And then by these selections here, you can center it and now it is ready to go. I have my square on my board and I have my letters. And I think this is kind of where he hung up because if you go from this directly into manufacturing, you, it's only going to allow you to manufacture outside because these aren't actual lines around it. So it doesn't really allow you to carve it out as a pocket like, like what we want to do. So in order to do that, I have to basically make my stock and I'm going to do that by extruding this, which I can click this shortcut here for extrude or go in here and do this. And you see here the hot key is also the letter E. So when I extrude, if I extrude up, what this will actually do is hide my lettering. And I want my lettering to actually be on top of the stock so I can then extrude that down into the stock. So I'll change this to negative 20, uh, but I actually want it to be a three quarter inch. So negative 0.75 times 25.4. So I guess at this point, I should have changed that from metric just for this last step, just to show you how you won't have to do that calculation if you don't want to. So I've changed it from millimeters to inches and I'm good. So now I've got my square stock here. I want to make these letters do just what the uh, wood did and extrude them down into it. And here you can kind of see the lines in the trace. And if I go too deep, it cuts through. And by you can, if you wanted to cut this all the way through, you can do that. And it's just going to ignore the extra extrusion that you made it go through. If I can get the angle right here. By clicking that, you can see the red goes through the stock. Now, if I use a different option here, like intersect or cut or join, it's going to do different. And new body is going to make those letters into a brand new body that's kind of inside of this body. Um, so that's kind of weird. 
So I want this to be a quarter inch deep. Negative 0.25 inches deep. And now I'm going to, you can see there, the pocket that I'm going to have. I'm going to press OK. And then I'm going to hide this sketch now. So you can see I've generated essentially what he is seeing on the easel one here at the end. So that's our end result is carving these out. And we've created the end result with a 3D model now. So the next step is to jump over into our manufacturing tool. And you see how it, the units change back to my default of millimeters. I'll change that back to inches for now. And then and this kind of runs from left to right. Um, I'm going to go through and create a new setup. And one of the things it does here in defaults, it adds offsets. Um, it kind of assumes you're machining something out of a block and it kind of adds offsets to it. So you'll always clean up the outsides anyway. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and zero those out. And that sets my stock setup to be what my dimensional board was. Now in this part here, I went back to the first tab so that we can adjust this stock point and talk about that real quick. If you want this to be treated like easel and to do the way easel does your models traditionally is a front left corner zeroing and going off from there, you can do that. Uh, although you can also set the zero wherever you want to. Zeroing from this point, if you have clamps over here, you may end up impacting your clamps. So I don't love to do that. As well, when you clamp something down, the pulling force down can sometimes cause the center to bow. So as you go to and do any engraving or D-bit work in the center, your zeros are actually wrong because you set it over here where it's lower and then as it goes over here, it's, the material is higher. So I like to use the center and I'll draw a line across my stock from corner to corner and I'll have the center point already marked. So I'm going to set it as that for now. And by pressing OK, my stock is now all set up. And this is what the stock is that I'm going to be using. So I'll turn that model back on for a second. And we can go in here and we can use adaptive clearing, but doing simple pockets like these, these small little pockets, um, adaptive clearing, even though it is less wear on the tool and more even wear on the tool, instead of carving away thick spots and then thin spots like pocketing tends to do. Since it's faster to compute and typically faster to carve, I'm going to go ahead and choose pocket. And the first thing I'm going to select here is my tool. For this, I'm going to use my local library. And there, there are some sample tools already created in here. You can also import libraries from other places. I'm going to use this two millimeter flat end mill to make sure I can get everywhere in this carve that is going to retain some of the detail. So we'll see how that looks. And if that is taking too long, we can always come back and change this. So the next step after selecting the tool, we go through here and we select our pocket areas. And I like to do that by selecting this gray thing on the bottom. So by selecting the gray area on the bottom, it automatically sets it to that area. If I cutting the inside of this path, if I select the line like this, I now have an arrow prompt here that if I Click that arrow itself, it changes it to the outside of that path and really kind of messes with what I'm doing. And it's going to carve out everything else down to that depth, including all the stock that I want to keep. So I'm going to go ahead and, and unselect that by selecting it right here and click in that trash can button and then go through and select these again. Now, even if you didn't change that arrow, one of the issues you could come across is this letter like this with an A, a P, a D, or, or whatnot with a, an island in the center. If I select this, by default, it doesn't also select the island. And the only way that I can select this island is by moving around to be able to see the bottom. So I now have to do that, click two different places, Versus if I do it over here, I'll show you on the O, it automatically deselects the island for me.
get rid of these, and finish selecting these the way that I normally do by turning the bottom gray and then clicking. And the bottom turns gray by you know just hovering over an area that is the bottom face. Now, if you're not getting that, your select tool up here might not be set to faces. And that is this box here. Okay, now that we have all that selected, I can back out of my view here a little bit and show you that what we've got going on. So we've got those faces. Our next step here is to go through and verify some heights. So I'm set to retract 0.4 inches. I'm gonna change this to 0 0.1. these as well. And you'll notice this clearance is essentially where the tool first starts and ends, like the new origin safety height in easel. And the retract height is the movement around. And if it was going to move from point to point within a pocket, while it's um, carving that out, that's where the feed height comes into play. So the next thing here is we have our top height, which is the stock top. So the reason why I selected the bottom of the contours in that previous step is our default height is set to selected contours. So it's going to go to wherever I clicked at. So had I clicked the top and done this outline, it's going to carve error. It'll actually give me an error and tell me that it can't load um, a toolpath. But since I selected the bottom of the of the pockets and this is set to select a contour, it's going to just carve down to the bottom of that. So we're going to move on to the next tab here, which are these passes. Sometimes what I like to do actually now is just select OK and have it calculate. Then we can see what the defaults are. Uh, because I changed some of those clearance heights to optimize this and to make sure like if you're using a 3018 machine, you don't crash into the top. Um, it's telling me that some heights later on on the next tabs were being overridden because of my clearance heights, which is fine. So it looks like we have pretty much what he's seeing here in his easel one. Uh, I, I did think, yeah, I do see that there's multiple blue lines there indicating step downs are set, which is good. Um, so we'll go ahead and add those in here in just a minute, but I'm going to simulate this one to show what it's going to look like the way it is currently. We can move this slider here to make it speed up a little bit more. It looks okay. I have stop on collision checked over here. So if there was any issues with my bid colliding with a stock during one of the unintended times, like during that transition over, uh, it would freeze the simulation and I get a red tick mark down here and an explanation that it has collided with the stock outside of a normal feed rate movement. Um, that doesn't happen too often, but I have messed up some heights before where that uh, did pop up. So always run your simulations. But uh, it looks pretty good. My end result is basically what he had in easel. Um, so we can go through and, and edit those toolpaths to add in the step downs and to fix that excess uh, lifting height there that was giving me the warning. So in this passes tab, we can turn on multiple depths right here. And that's going to give us our step downs. And the default step down I have set for this bit is right at about half the bit diameter per layer. So it's going to do multiple step downs to achieve our end depth. And if you want to, let's say there's uh, your bits leaving the tooling marks on the bottom. If you want to get rid of that tooling mark or minimize it, you can do a finishing step down. This sample photo here shows like four. And what those do is it's a lot finer of a step down. So there's less material engaged and it tends to leave less of the swirly tooling marks um, or fuzzies from it at the very bottom depth. So the other default thing that's checked here is stock to leave. And when I hope over here, it shows a little better. What that actually does is it leaves material on the side and if you have axial turned on, on the bottom as well. So since we're not running a finishing tool path and this is only one tool that we're going in here with, I'm gonna turn those off. Otherwise I'm not gonna get my full depth and I'm not going to get my full width in each of these pockets. So let's jump over here to this linking tab and fix that error that was popping up. Um, you'll see here that the one that was causing the error is red and that's indicating that the heights from the height tab are lower 
understand what this is. So I'll just change that to 0 0.01. Click OK. I don't get the warning anymore. And our toolpath, instead of being six minutes, is now 26 and a half minutes because of all those step downs and the step overs of a two millimeter bit. So now we are all set to save this toolpath. However, in the last video that I posted, a viewer noticed that I was manually editing the G code to delete the automatic tool changer function that is default included in the code. And he pointed out that the easy way to get rid of that is to go in here in machine library and create your own custom machine, which I've done here. And you can enter that machine to have your own custom name um, and dimensions. And then the capabilities tab, the important part here is to uncheck automatic tool changer. And you can do a few other functions here, set up your workpiece size, as well as your coolant, whether it has it or not. And your post processors can be preloaded in here. So let's say you're using a shape of Poco, a Onefinity, a Nextcarve, a WorkB, and a 3018. You can set up all those machines for each, set up the post processors for each of them, and then go through and select your machine in here. And when you go to post process, it will remove that line of code about the uh, automatic tool changer. So now I have no reason to edit this code anymore once it's created in here. So if you are using an Xcarve, you can install the ESOL post processor, the same one that I'm using here. And it works perfect to import the G code into ESOL and run through ESOL. Alternatively, if you have a Shaboko or a Onefinity or other CNC machine, you can follow their instructions to download their post processor and direct it to the folder where it's saved at in here. So now with this G code saved, normally there'd be a line right here that says T1M6 that I'd have to delete. With that new machine set up, there's no reason to do that step. So we can go from here directly into open builds and I can open the file in open builds and it generates this 3D toolpath view for me. And again, the same way moving around in Fusion 360 by holding shift and using the track wheel on the mouse, clicking it and holding it down, I can rotate this around, which also helps me verify whether my Z zero is set on the top or the bottom. And with this, I'm ready to connect to my machine and run this carve. 